and uh, and um, uh, it's been a terrific uh, uh, person to work with and a terrific doctoral student now. Uh, and I decided to take on a very ambitious project uh, for his dissertation research on which uh, he spent uh, literally several years. And uh, I was fortunate to, to be um, advising him and being engaged in that project with him. And so a lot of the credits of what I will share with you today really uh, goes to him um, rather than me. And, um, and the project was uh, triggered by, by simple observation that uh, a lot of uh, very substantial industries um, whereas it be the, the gaming industry, amusement park industry, party industry, even certain locations and destinations really revolve around an overall promise uh, of, uh, of providing to consumers uh, an experience that we call fun. And, um, and that prompted us to try to decide to understand what really is this experience and more importantly, how do you generate this experience of fun if uh, you need to, to do that for, for a business. And um, that's uh, where the connection to business school comes in. And the starting point for us was simply, you know, uh, uh, to sort of look at what we know about the concept. And it turns out that, that we don't know that much about it. There are certain definitions you can find of the term, of course, in the dictionary. And we all sort of understand what the, the concept and the, the word means and which uh, without, Delivering the definitions themselves can be, you know, roughly summarized as a, a pleasurable experience ca characterized by subjective ex feelings of enjoyment, amusement, often with a certain mental state that is more playful. And, and so that's uh, what we all understand of to be the experience of fun. And the question is that that's going to be more important is now that we can somehow all agree on what that experience is like and what it is. The question is, how do you get there and what are the underlying factors that brings individuals to that state uh, of fun? And um, so one of the ways uh, not to do it uh, um, for studying it will be simply to go to consumers and ask them, what do you do uh, for having fun? Uh, because if you were to do that, you will find something like this that's going to be that, you know, there's a lot of activities that people find fun and it could be hiking, go-karting, going to an amusement park, it could be watching TV, dancing, singing, it could be a lot of things. And, uh, and in fact, um, not everybody does the same thing for having fun. And, and therefore, monitoring the activities that consumers uh, engage in for getting at this experience of fun is really not the right way to go if you really want to understand how to get there. And uh, sort of the approach that we use uh, is to try to deconstruct uh, some, what we call the psychological pillars of fun. So what are the common core principles that lead different types of activities for different types of consumers to be, uh, to be fun? And, uh, and so we spent, uh, and Travis in particular, spent several years uh, trying to understand very deeply what uh, uh, really gets at uh, this experience of fun whether you're doing it through you know, an experience of goat karting or going to a movie, et cetera, whatever your preferences might be, are there some common principles that really explains um, how people get at this experience of fun? And um, so once we, so that was the overall agenda. And, and it's interesting when you try to think about this concept, which is uh, we're gonna be tackling from a very psychological perspective to look at it um, uh, and step back a little bit to try to have a broader, more historical and sociological background to sort of see where that experience, psychological experience of fun may be coming uh, from. And interestingly, um, um, so we sort of went back in time, if you will, to try to trace the history of uh, the language for fun. And from there, you can sort of try to see the history of the institutions that might be responsible for fun and then eventually um, have a deeper, uh, more coherent and grounded understanding of, of the psychology of fun. And the first observation to make is that the, uh, the word fun, as we understand it, as I just explained it to you, is a term that in, entered in the English language relatively late, so around the 18th century. And, um, 
prior to that, there was uh, the word fun was used mostly in a way that was uh, very different. Is uh, in the context of making fun of someone, which is very different. And but the, the idea of uh, of having fun as a pleasurable experience that is lighthearted and so on and so forth is really entered only entered the English language around the 18th century. And the use of the adjective, um, this would be fun, or this is a fun party, is even later than that, around the 19th century. So, so first observation uh, is that the term entered the English language relatively late. And the question is that, why did we took us so long to acquire a term that we today um, take for granted is a very important term, um, and that is uh, somehow central to you know, human experience. So we go back in time, and, and uh, it occurred to us so that uh, that uh, you know first of all we can sort of look at it, is it indeed the case that the term you know evolve and enter slowly the language? Another place you can sort of look at would be to use uh, the Google Books and Gram viewers, you know, which is sort of traces. Um, relative frequency of words or phrases uh, in books that were indexed by Google over time. And as you know, Google started the indexing for books that went all the way back to the 1800s. And you can sort of see that um, a phrase such as having fun, which is the kind of phrase that we're talking about now, is really a phrase that you know, never appeared and somehow uh, until you know, it became somewhat a little bit more noticeable at the beginning of the 20th century really started climbing the second half of the 20th century. Now we sort of see relatively prominent terms, whereas um, you know, other equivalent phrases such as being happy or feeling proud were essentially flat over time. Okay, so it's not just that positive emotional experience are more important, it's just like a, that particular experience seems to have a trajectory that has, inclined, that, that, that has increased relatively uh, recently. And um, so as we dig, deeper into, into what might have been uh, at work, we, we found that there were really three factors, uh, historical factors that seem to have contributed over time to the experience of fun being so central and being what it is today. And, uh, and, and those factors are not necessarily obvious, uh, but, uh, once, uh, but they will help us understand the psychology that uh, I will explain a bit later that we ended up uh, uncovering. Um, the first factor that uh, was noticeable uh, and that uh, seemed to have been playing a big role in uh, the emergence of the experience of fun is uh, the Industrial Revolution, you know? um, so, which uh, started at the end of the 18th century and went all the way through the middle, roughly, of the, of the 19th century. And, 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 and why it is important is that because um, you know, prior to the Industrial Revolution, labor was very fragmented distributed and especially closed and located mostly closer to where people live. And, um, and so um, in, the, in the industrial revolution, as you know, people started moving to factories and, uh, and to central locations where there was a dedicated place for other people, many people to be working. And, and so that's gonna be something important. So labor became concentrated in specific locations and also in specific times of the day. And that created in, 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 in society a sharper partition between what we consider to be, to, to be work and what we consider to be, to be play. And, and that sharp transition was uh, separation, sorry, will become an important uh, background factor that will help us understand the psychology of fun later on. Um, another force that was slightly subsequent to the industrial revolution that was also at work uh, is uh, the emergence of compensatory uh, education. So kids had to go to school, it was mandated. And, and this is something that started uh, in uh, Central Europe uh, around Prussia and Denmark. It started moving west uh, toward the UK and eventually came to the new world uh, from, you know, the, let's say 1830s to the, all the way through the beginning of the, the 20th century. And, and what happened in compensatory uh, education creates a dynamics, a sociological dynamic that is very similar to what happened uh, in the Industrial Revolution, but that was now targeted at children, where children who were playing and doing things during the daytimes and maybe the work helping, working on the farms, et cetera, all of a sudden now had to be in a place where there was a concentrated seriousness, you know, which was where they were supposed to be taught. 
And, um, in, uh, and again, you had this, this very strong demarcation between what is serious play, a uh, serious, um, a serious place to work, you know, to do serious work, which is studying and, and learning, and uh, the, the play time, uh, which was, uh, you know, mostly relegated outside of the school. And if it has to be within the school, it would be in a dedicated time, like during recess, in a dedicated place during the schoolyard. So we have these uh, very similar types of dynamics where there's a strong separation between serious work and then play that is supposed to be in a separate time in a separate place. Uh, so that brings us to, to you know, so roughly to the beginning of the, of the 20th century. And there's a third set of factors that was not so, really sociological, but was, was more of a marketplace factor. So in the, in the, through the 20th century, there's emergence of new industries that revolve around the mass production and the mass distribution of entertainment. Okay? So you can think about Hollywood so that started in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the um, television, which uh, was uh, the latter half of the 20th century, the amusement park, also the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, of course, television also supports the, uh, the emergence and the growth of professional sports, which is also a major industry for entertainment. So you have all these forces, and um, if you stack them up, will be responsible and, and help understand why fun um, will emerge the way I will uh, explain to you it ended up um, emerging psychologically. So that's um, the, um, uh, in a nutshell, some of the background that uh, will help us understand uh, some of the things that I'm about to share with you in terms of what we found. So I said uh, that we uh, went on this uh, deep investigation that really focuses not on the sociology uh, of fun, but really on the psychology. So now let's look at the level of the individual as opposed to the level of history or the level of broader um, you know, sociological forces. And as we did our research, we found that, that, uh, that there'll be some core principles that, uh, that we call psychological pillars. And, and those core principles, we, um, we were able to find them by, by you know, not because they exist in the literature, you know, like some of the projects that a consumer researcher might engage in where there may be some good psychological theories that could be imported and leveraged uh, to, to get insights. Here, we really had to, to build a theory from the ground up, if you will. And in fact, the approach that we use is a very qualitative approach at the beginning that is known as grounded theory, and where we collected a lot of qualitative data, you know, depth interviews, or written narratives, and which uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, content analyzing and reading and rereading and coding, et cetera, that uh, uh, led us to, to, to essentially develop the theory, which uh, then we went on to validate and test in a way that is a bit more traditional, more quantitative, if you will, through structural equation modeling, experiments, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and then they, and we also in bank, uh, triangulated these data also with more ethnographic data. So we had a lot of data that, that you know, told us a story that was quite coherent from a very different um, methodological perspectives, but they ended up you know, converging into the, the narrative that, uh, and the theory that I'm about to share with you. Um, so sorry, I'm going relatively fast because uh, we only have uh, you know, 40 minutes or so uh, in total. And, then, um, and, and so I'm gonna sort of tell you a little bit some of the things we found in, in uh, uh, mostly on our qualitative uh, uh, investigations. And then if we have time, I might share some of the more quantitative data. So as I said, uh, we, we, we did uh, those uh, in-depth interviews. Uh, you know, there were 21 in-depth interviews that we did with you know, not students. There were um, not only students, of course, some students, but we all interviewed you know, like, um, casino dealers, um, chefs, retired teachers. So we started to review a broad range of, of individuals, including even a homeless who was very instrumental in reinforcing some of the concepts we found when we in interviewed her because there were, her life experience was very unique. And, really um, somehow help us uncover some things that was quite, quite interesting as well. Uh, we, we supplemented those uh, interviews, in-depth interviews with data that was from a broader range of consumers from all over the US who share with us, uh, um, we call personal narratives of having fun. And then they go into detail into, you know, uh, about their experiences uh, and, um, uh, and, and what, 
what's interesting to us is uh, for those of you who do, do sometimes research online using mechanical turks and things like that, what was interesting to us is how willing people were to share uh, with us th those experiences. Uh, the average length of what people told us was to, you know, they didn't have to tell us that many words, but they volunteered on average about 332 words. That's, that's, that's the amount of text that you would see on this slide here. So the really people were really into it and they're really getting into this uh, sharing a lot because it turns out to be fun to be telling you or telling us about experience of fun. So people enjoy doing it. So as I said, we, we read uh, this and content analysis and we have, a, I think 70,000 words of content that, 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 that we try to conceptualize and, and uh, uh, over you know, maybe a couple of years that we spent with the data. And, and we found that, uh, that, that the, there are really two recurring forces that together, together seem to be explaining all experiences of fun. And, and, and these are two forces that need to take place jointly, and, um, and, uh, and, but they end up being the, uh, the, the, the core pillars of the experience of fun. Uh, the first one is something that we call hedonic engagement. And by hedonic engagement is that um, in all the experiences that people were sharing with us, um, they, they always describe being psychologically and immersed, very immersed into an activity. But it's not just any type of activity. It's an activity that they are doing for pure enjoyment. So first of all, so it's very tough to have fun unless you're psychologically engaged, that's one. But second is this, is this engagement is not the kind of engagement that you might have if you are reading, let's say, a book, right? And uh, where you're trying to study the books, you can be, you know, it, it should be an activity that you are really engaged in for the sake of it and for the pleasure of it. And so imagine that, uh, that uh, someone is playing tennis and then there's really a very different type of engagement if you're just hitting rallying balls just for the sake of just hitting the balls, as opposed to someone who is more like, a, let's say, uh, you know, taking lessons or, or, you know, training to be, you know, a, a college player, level players, the kind of practice that they have may be very psychologically engaging, but it's not as fun just because they are doing it for a, a purpose that is external uh, to the, um, the the activity, the enjoyment of the activity itself. And so I'll explain to you, to give you, and we have a lot of these, but to give you a sense of the, the, uh, of the kind of things people told us that was indicative of that, that uh, hedonic engagement. So he's one person here, uh, it's a, a woman from uh, California, 39. Uh, and um, she said that my friends and I decided to try one of these escape rooms things. And wow, it was so much fun. We had to work together to solve puzzles and to get out of each room and nothing was too hard and the stories surrounding each pieces were really engaging. So she really sharing with us that she was into it, right? And she was able to stay into it. And that was part of the, of, of, of the force of the mechanism that was responsible for their fun. It was not the only one. You will see the another major things that we need, we need to, to take place. Um, here's another uh, testimony here from a, a, another shared experience from another woman uh, who was attending one of these uh, Renaissance fairs. So these are the kind of costume fairs that, uh, that emerges here and there, and there you can spend an afternoon. It was fun because you get to pretend for a little while. So she's really getting engaged and playing along and role playing. Um, and the performers encourage you to interact with them in, in character and play around with you and your responses. It's a lot of fun to be immersed. She uses the word immersion here in this, uh, and in this fake overtime period and just play around like you're a kid playing pretend. So, so we have a lot of these narratives and it really there's a clearly this necessary component of being psychologically, psychologically engaged in an activity that is really enjoyable for its own sake. Um, but there's a second one that, that emerged and that ended up being, we think for Travis and I, the more interesting perhaps pillar of fun. Um, and, and that we call the sense of liberation. And um, one of the things that was really striking uh, when you read these narratives or listen to what people share during those, uh, those interviews uh, is the words that they use. And, and they, some of the recurring words that they use uh, would be words such as free, carefree, let loose, loosen up, wild, going out, uh, going all out, feeling like a kid, total abandon. So there's really uh, a very 
prominent theme of freedom that, that, uh, that people are linking to this experience of fun. And, um, and so I, I, I share with you maybe a couple uh, of, of the narratives that, were, that, were, you know, that we listened to and uh, that we heard. So he's this, uh, this person, he's sharing, the last time I had fun was when I, I went to Tahoe with friends over the summer. We had rented a 10 person cabin packed for three days and drunk like there was no tomorrow. By the way, we saw a lot of alcohol mentioned as, a, as a, many of these narratives. And I couldn't remember the last time I smiled and laughed that much. It was so liberating. She didn't even use the word liberation. So there's really this sense of freedom that you have there and letting loose. Okay? Um, the, uh, another one that, uh, that I remember very, very clearly is from, uh, from a, an interview with the 73-year-old Greek American. He's a retired teacher. And, um, and this person you know, mentioned that uh, he was having fun when he was younger and he, and he really had fun by dancing. And say, oh, what makes dancing fun? Well, it's total abandon. So letting, you know, you get inspired by the music, you jump up and down. Had you seen me in my youth, you know, you know and then uh, and then he said, you let go, you know, you let go of everything, you get up and dance. In fact, in the middle of the interview, he stopped and then started actually dancing around, you know, for, for a few minutes, well, for, you know, for a few seconds, um, uh, because that person really was a, was a really quite a character. And and so he's talking about this sense of abandonment. So clearly freedom is gonna be a, a central part of, a, of the experience of fun. But what was interesting is not freedom exactly, uh, because um, in addition to mentioning these words, there's often another sets of words that they would mention, such as um, oh, a break from, being away from, get away, forget about escape. So not only people have freedom, but in experience of fun, they are somehow zooming in on a certain experience of freedom from something. There is something that they want to be free from, that they are being free from, or they feel free from, that, that is also central to the experience of fun. And that's why we, we, we ended up uh, calling this not freedom, the pillar, the freedom is not, the pillar is not freedom, is really liberation. And um, so here's, uh, here's an example. Um, I had fun a few days ago on Halloween when I spent the whole day with my three little sisters. All I had been doing the past year is work, work, work. It was a nice break to just spend the day with my sisters. I felt as if I was free on Halloween because I was not working. I was just enjoying the day with my family and sisters. So really that person having fun, it's not a Halloween per se, but it's because he had been working and Halloween and the time with his sisters was as a means, as a way for him to move away from all the pressure and the constraint that he had with all the work that he had. So a very recurring theme in the experience of fun is this something that you, these, uh, that you are able to free yourself from. Yeah. And um, now very often in many of those, uh, those narrative and experiences that we heard, uh, it was often freedom from work, of course, freedom from school, freedom from house chores and uh, child, uh, child care, which is a common theme here. But it's not just those ones. There's also freedom from other, whatever constraint people have on themselves. And a good example is this lady who um, uh, shared with us that she normally tried to constrain, restrain herself from overeating. Okay? And so the best moment uh, were when I was eating sweets, I'm overweight and I'm constantly trying to watch my diet. I try not to eat any sugar and try to eliminate carbs altogether. But then one day her children went away and then she started letting loose. Okay? Uh, by giving myself this break, I allowed myself to be naughty. I gave myself permission to rest and enjoy life for a few days. I sneak into my kids' Easter candy bags. I did not care if I gained 10 pounds. I was just letting myself go. So really this person now is really now has this, uh, not only she's uh, free from the children being away, but also she's free from not having to watch her diet. And that is part of the fun. And, uh, and so, so this second, second pillar that uh, we, we identified is really what we call felt liberation, which we define as a temporary release from various form of internalized restriction, uh, such as professional obligations, parental duties, schoolwork, financial constraints, and self-imposed discipline. So this is a fairly broad construct uh, that we have there. Now let's go back to what I told you about the industrial revolution, what I told you about, about mandatory school. You can sort of see that that this psychology 
emerged in part and in reaction to the constraints that the Industrial Revolution placed on, on people, the school placed on people, because it regimented people's lives and say, okay, this is the place where you're not supposed you know, to be playing. This is the place where you're supposed to do real work. And this is the time where you're supposed to do real work. And now as a reaction to that, you had the psychologist say, Oof, I don't have that on my shoulder anymore. And that's really psychologically very rewarding, very pleasurable. So that's one of the connections that you see there. Okay, and that's true for adults as well as children. It doesn't have to be constrained from work. You know, that's something that uh, we found uh, uh, as well, but uh, any kind of constraints, and if you can somehow liberate yourself from it and find a hedonically engaging activity to do that, that would be something that will lead to fun. So if you were to summarize uh, our theory, um, the, uh, the theory sort of says there's these two forces that uh, you have to have some level of hedonic engagement, you need to have some level of liberation, and it is jointly when those two take place together that, that people have this experience of fun. And um, so at the extreme low end uh, of, this, of this chart here would be the things that are not liberating and not um, canonically engaging, you know, like commuting, doing repetitive work, you know, being quarantined. So this is you're clearly not having fun when you're doing any of these. Uh, but uh, you can try to believe, uh, you know, to the whole bunch of activities that you can have that are hedonically engaging, that are really pleasurable, like severing a glass of wine or, you know, getting a massage, getting a delicious meal, listening to a beautiful concert classical, of classical music. These are very pleasurable, but you will not characterize these as typically fun. Okay? You have, you know, it's like, it's pleasant to do, but that's not the classic experience of fun. Or you can have a uh, liberation. Right? So you can be liberated from you know, not having to work. You can be liberated from a burden, liberated because your jury duty has been completed. But again, these are not the typical uh, fun experience. Uh, it's really, you need both. Okay? And, uh, and, and, and if you can get both you know, uh, at the same time, this is where you're gonna have the classic experiences of fun, right? And such as you know, exploring a new city when traveling, or when being on vacation, or going to an amusement park on a weekend, or going, are we friends uh, uh, doing happy hours, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so that's, that's in essence the, the, the core major factors of our theory. And, and our theory really doesn't stop there because uh, you know, not only we find uh, you know, these two pillars of hedonic engagement and sense of liberations, but then we also identify that there are factors that seem to be contributing to the experience of fun uh, by enabling either a greater level of hedonic engagement or, or, is, or, a, or a greater sense of liberation. And, and we call these situational facilitators. They are not necessary or sufficient for the experience of fun, but they, they on average tend to contribute to the experience of fun because they facilitate either hedonic engagement or the sense of liberation. And sort of um, uh, to give you a sense of those factors, um, they, um, we identified four. You know, uh, one is that on average, uh, um, novelty seems to be contributing to fun. Um, um, and the second one uh, that we identify is we call what we call social connectedness. Right? Uh, so when people have this uh, feeling of in the moment being connected with others, it's gonna be an important theme as well. So, and uh, um, spontaneity is, uh, is the third one. And then the last one is, um, is uh, paradoxically, experiences of fun are being facilitated when they are bounded in time and, 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 and space. And that's, uh, the, uh, you will see the logic for that uh, um, you know, very, very shortly. Right. Uh, so novelty, I think is perhaps the most intuitive one. Um, you know, it's more fun to do something for the first time, if you will, right? Uh, and so we heard a lot of people saying first time, never done it before, it's unique, something like that. Uh, interestingly though, it's not just about doing it for the first time. It's, it's okay if you have done it before, but very often when they, if they've done it before, it's, they're having fun because it's been a long while since they have not done it. Okay, so, so it's what we're gonna call like relative novelty. So for example, here, riding the rides at the amusement park was especially fun. I hadn't done it anything like this since I was a fairly young child. It was so exhilarating to, you know, and, and if a little more frightening than I remember it uh, being um, years ago. So. 
novelty could be absolute or relative uh, is something that contribute to the experience of fun. Um, the other one is what we call, as we say, social connectedness. And social connectedness doesn't mean that you're surrounded with people. You know, that's not the point. So it, so you can be, um, you know, it's, it's, you, know, you can be not having fun if, even if you're surrounded with people, but the idea of uh, being connected, the idea that you are experiencing something in the moment with others, that seems to be an important driver of having fun. And, um, and so, you know, these, these two, um, Person, well, this person is describing a trip, a fishing trip with some of with his friends, and uh, we had a great time sitting on the water and talking about random topics. We had some lunch that we packed. We stopped to take a few pictures of the lake and surrounding trees. Then we showed each other a few of the pictures about them. The trip to home, uh, the trip home uh, took a while, but we had fun in the car, talking to uh, uh, about our day and joking uh, how we could tell everyone that we caught ten fish. In reality, we didn't catch anything, but the point of the trip was to have fun. Um, it's just a very typical uh, thing that people share. So it's, it's this bonding, this moment of being, you know, sharing something together, right? And that moment, and, and by the way, it's mostly with, um, with friends, you know, to some extent as well family. Sometimes you still see people describing bonding with their, their pets. You know, they're, they're, they're with, their, 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 with an animal, their, their dog, et cetera. But this moment of connection, with them uh, is, is really um, something that facilitated the experience of fun. Then spontaneity is another one that emerged uh, as well. Uh, and, and you can sort of see why it would be the case, right? Because um, the experience of fun rests heavily on, this, uh, on a feeling of liberation. And so, so not having to plan things or, or, or being able to improvise the way you do things that's gonna be a big ingredient that contributes to the experience of fun. And we have many of those experiences, many uh, of these you know, shared experiences that, that go in that direction here. Um, and the last one and it's, um, is that we found, this is something that, that really we were not expecting to find up front. This is something that we really discovered as we were reading these and, and listening to these tapes, et cetera. And um, it's occurred to us that uh, that whenever people are, are, are describing experience of fun, they are always locating that experience in a very specific space and place, and again, in a, in a very specific moment in time. And so there's an experience of fun, there's a usually a beginning and there's an end. So the fun starts and the fun ends. That's one thing, it's very well marked in time, uh, but it's also well marked in spaces. There are places where pe people feel more comfortable to have fun. So you can go to an amusement park, you go to, to a bar, uh, you can go to the playroom, you can go, it, and, and now you can again see the connection to the schoolyard that I was telling you uh, earlier, that fun is an experience that we are more likely to experience in a place that is designated for fun. And, uh, and it's because it's designated for fun, then we feel more liberated, right? Because if you go back to the historical force I described earlier, we have grown in a culture that sort of separates serious time and from the, the non-serious, the leisure play time. And so somehow it's, we have internalized this concept that there are certain places for us that is where it's okay for us to have, uh, to have fun. And paradoxically, these constraints, these boundaries, this space that you, you, you carve around, around that makes it more, more, more likely for people to have fun. Um, so, um, so, so that's why, you know, amusement parks, you know, have certain boundaries. That's why, uh, you know, the, the, the old saying, you know, it's very slogan, the marketing slogan, let's say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas is very good, you know, because it really says that it's okay for you. you do whatever you want in Vegas, but it stays within those boundaries. And, um, and that's, uh, um, 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 again, um, helps this, uh, this overall experience of fun. Um, so, so that's uh, in a sense in this chart here, this overall theory that we had uh, uncovered mostly uh, through this qualitative type of research. And, um, you know, and so again, it has these two central pillars of the experience of fun, uh, at least four sets of factors that, uh, that, that contributes to this experience of fun, um, you know, novelty, uh, social connectedness, spontaneity, and uh, spatial, spatial and temporal boundedness. Um, so that's the theory. And, and, and to be honest, 
the rest of data collection we have done is was essentially mostly icing on the cake because what we found is that the data, the additional data that we collected ended up being supportive of that theory that we had uncovered in a more qualitative fashion. So, so for example, I'll share with you one slide here from a, can develop items and scale items that would measure so, so these constructs. And, and if you do you know, a structural equation model, you will see that, that the structure, the model that fits the data uh, the best is indeed the structure that, that I just described that you have these two um, factors here, hedonic engagement and, and sense of liberation that contributes to the experience of fun. And, uh, and you have a uh, you know, at least four situational uh, facilitators uh, that uh, you know also contribute to the experience of fun, but their contribution is indirect. It's done it either through increasing uh, you know, engagement or increasing the sense of of, of liberation here. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, we can also test that more experimentally. Uh, we have done experiments in which, uh, and that's not in the paper, but we have additional data where we can. Um, prime people to have more fun. And, and what we had done is um, in one study is that uh, we gave people to solve anagrams and, um, and there's three conditions, there's a control condition. Uh, the anagram words that people can identify are you know, like neutral words, like example content. Uh, and then we have a condition we call, you know, which is not a control condition where it's an achievement condition. So it's pleasant. Uh, the words would be achieve, fulfill. So people can find something positive among those words here, but not necessarily related to, to, to liberation or fun. And the third condition we had, the, anag uh, the anagram was created so that words such as carefree, liberated could be, could be found. And they solved two, uh, you know, uh, more than one set of these, you know, there were additional sets that, you know, you know, added, you know somehow prime additional concepts related to liberation, such as released, loosened, et cetera. And, uh, and what you find is that, that uh, in terms of engagement, um, they, uh, you know, they, they slightly more engaging, not significantly so uh, for, um, for the, when people are primed for words uh, with words of uh, indicative of liberation. But in terms of, uh, of, uh, of fun of doing those anagrams, um, then the, the people who were primed with words connected to liberation uh, found it to be significantly more fun. Right? Um, we have another experiment that uh, I'll describe it relatively uh, succinctly um, is uh, it's in one in which we had uh, people role play being on a submarine, uh, uh, being on, on, on the, uh, being sailors and they have to be on a, on a three month sailing trip. And, um, and, and within that, but we have two conditions and, and then, they, uh, and then they, they have a port of, uh, of call where they can you know, stop over and they spend a weekend there on the ground and there's a party there they can join and meet you know, um, uh, other people. And then with the dependent variable is how much fun you know, would be to go to that party and how much fun would, but we had two condition. One condition, the sailors were on the um, uh, aircraft carrier uh, and that's the control condition. In the other condition, the sailors are in a submarine, right? which is much more, of course, much more confined, right? And, and, and then we asked them after, after, after uh, uh, you know, how much fun did they have at the party, presumably, uh, you can see that the people who were in the submarine clearly uh, said, oh, I had much, much more fun at party. The party is the same, but it's just because they were so confined and therefore it's the party and being on board of call is much more liberating for them. And, and that really uh, gives them uh, much more fun. Um, we had lots of other data that was quite fun. Um, maybe I'll sort of say, and I apologize, I only have like one minute left here. Um, one thing, and this is you know, it's important for you because, and for us as well, because we are in business school, uh, one of the key findings in our research is that experiences of fun are more anchored in consumption. So uh, it, it, if you code the narratives of what people say when they're having fun, um, if you compare that to control conditions, like for example, a happy experience or an interesting experience, you will find that that the context that they describe are more likely to be consumption context. So fun is, is very central to business because, uh, because it is a type of hedonic experience that individuals have and seek uh, that is more connected to consumption. So people consume, uh, are more likely to consume to have funds. And so obviously that has a very uh, important um, business uh, 
relevance and connection. And this is something that we find uh, across a lot of our data. Um, last thing to, to, to sort of tell you uh, to do the kind of things we have done without uh, um, you know, going into the, the findings, we also did this, what we call photoethnography, where, where we had people, we, we, worked with, we worked with a market research company and we had this large panel of, of consumers and we send them, asked them to send us pictures. And in one condition, there were pictures of, of them having fun or in the other condition of, of them being happy. And, and then we can't analyze them, you know, those, those pictures that they uploaded there. And, 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 and if you sort of look at uh, you know, the, the, some kind of things you can code on pictures, uh, from the pictures, you can see you, you, a lot of the things that are part of our theory ended up uh, being observable uh, in those pictures as well, such as, for example, uh, the fact there were more people in the pictures uh, that are connected to, to fun than, for example, to happiness, and which is um, connected to the, to the theme of social connectedness. There were, um, you know, uh, more likely to be a novelty that would be coded and detected from those pictures, etc. So there's uh, lots of things that uh, that we have done, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of I'm running out of time here, and so um, let me sort of summarize some of the key takeaways. And there's more in the, in the that we can read in, in the paper. First of all, you know, fun is a very important uh, set of experience uh, that's very connected and important for business. You know, there's big industries that rely on that. There are two major pillars that uh, that are responsible for those, for those experiences: hedonic engagement and sense of, uh, of liberation. And that's why we think that the psychology of fun is really uh, a psychology of liberating engagement. It's uh, very connected to consumption um, and, um, and, uh, and it has a variety of, uh, of, uh, of situational factors that, uh, that contribute to the experience of fun. Okay. So, um, so thank you very much for uh, you know, allowing me to go through most of my materials here. Now we have a few minutes to uh, so that I can answer uh, questions that you might have. And I will stop sharing that way we can see each other more clearly. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Farm. Um, that was amazing. Um, so uh, let me uh, ask uh, if there are any questions from the audience. I have a bunch of questions, but uh, I'd like to uh, invite the people from the audience. Uh, I think there's a question from uh, Professor El Ghazar. Yeah. Ah, Sami. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very uh, informing and very uh, intelligent. Um, I was looking, and I probably get some. Uh, some factors that I would like to use to turn my class uh, teaching as fun, because uh, especially those four facilitator factors, if I, if I succeed to implement them in my class, then I'm, I'm sure our learning uh, achievement will be uh, much more. Yeah. But uh, uh, my other observation is that uh, you, uh, the, the, the thesis is differentiating between leisure time and work time. Mm -hmm. my, my concern is that sometimes when we do our work, we have fun. Yep. For example, after, during you, doing your research and your co-author, you probably have I mean, there is a difference between, there is a little difference between fun and satisfaction or yep. fun and achievement. So if we wanted to link satisfaction and achievement to fun, yep. I think that should be your next project, how to move from leisure and create the work environment to have some fun aspects that okay. That, that, that could be good for companies to reduce the turnover ratio. Sure, sure. Uh, good for our, <laughs> for our school to, yeah. to have a higher rate of retention. Randy, sure. Randy is, is looking for that retention. <laughs> yeah. let, let, let me make two, a, a few observations, a few comments a bit based on, on, on your, 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 your questions and observations. So for the first things that 
uh, is about this notion of the educational setting. It turns out that the literature on fun uh, is very sparse. You don't find that much, but where it exists is um, uh, one of the areas in which it exists is in, precisely in education uh, because uh, every educator has always had the intuition that uh, it is, uh, if you want to get people to be intellectually engaged, we need to make whatever materials we give them, uh, you know, uh, somehow fun. And uh, so that's where there's, there's some literature here. Uh, interestingly, though, um, is that the literature that, that in the indication literature that talks about that mostly focuses on maintaining what we call hedonic engagement, right? That's a, it's okay. You know, it has to have some kind of stimulation, maybe through novelty would be a, a, a way of doing that. Um, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, um, what do you call, um, spontaneity, et cetera. The, the one dimension that educa the educational literature has not emphasized and recognized is the process of liberation. So, mm -hmm. so, so the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, we don't naturally think of that, but if you want to be engaging and fun, you can't not just try to work mostly on the, the the hedonic engagement dimension, you also have to work on the liberation, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the, um, so, so that's one, one, one aspect. With respect to the work settings, uh, two things that I, I wanna say. Uh, one of the things that you find, you write, people do have fun at work. And, and, and there was a very interesting work, uh, there's a, by done semi-anthropological research done in organization, organizational res, uh, settings where um, it's a paper called Banana Time and, uh, and uh, where the person actually went on in a, in a, um, in a factory and decided to, to, to sort of you know, observe what it is to what happening. And he was uh, somehow hired as, as a really, uh, as a worker working on metal on machines. And, and he somehow tells in his account about that somehow period, periodically, the workers that he was working with on, on, these, on, these, on these machines would just stop and start actually playing pranks on each other. Right? And it was regularly throughout the day, it would happen. And, and that's, uh, you know, essentially what, you know, you know um, illustrate the things that, that we talked about, that we need these periodic moments of release, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the release is not just energy release, it's also constraint release and you can play, be playful, et cetera. And, and, and so, so, you know, I think that's what you see, I guess, that's the intuition many of these, um, these new technology organizations that have some kind of playrooms, et cetera. But uh, one of the principles that we, we, we see in our work is the fact that it has to be dedicated. Is uh, it the time for you to have fun, right? Is it spaces for you to have fun, right? And which we are kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of doing by, you know, we, we go to the, let's say, to, uh, to the coffee machine and, and then we chit chat with, uh, with uh, some of our colleagues. So, so the, the idea that's, that if this is okay for us to be, to be having fun, that's, that's fine. I, I see that with my, with my co-authors, we, we sit down, we write papers, it's really hard, but you know, I, once in a while I cannot help and I would start us making a joke, I would chat, et cetera. And my doctor students often like find that kind of funny that I would do that, but, but we need that. We need to, to have that in order to maintain the engagement. Last thing that I wanna say, I did not cover that uh, in, 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 in the talk, but we did investigate the connection between fun and happiness. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and what we find is that uh, these are separate constructs, right? That, uh, and and, uh, and um, so on average, fun really precedes happiness. It says that if you're having fun, you're more likely to be happy. It's not the other way around. So you can be very happy and you, you will not characterize as an, an experience of fun. So in the paper, we found like uh, some connections where, where fun is one of the ways by which you can have happiness. The other way that we should get happiness um, that is independent of fun is through meaning. Right? And, and so doing something that is meaningful, uh, we find that, uh, that A, it leads to happiness, but if anything, people are more likely to have fun when it's not meaningful. You know? and, and so when it's not serious. Yeah. So it so was a long answer to, to your question, but- No, 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 it. thank you, thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Tan uh, Duan to ask her question. She's a student uh, at Lubin. Tan? Oh, hi. Hi, I have a question about the last Vegas thing. So I hear a lot of people saying that what stay in Vegas or what happens in Vegas stay in Vegas. Yeah, yeah. So, 
the, so does it mean that like if you want to have fun, you must go to Vegas? No, I mean the, what we want. The, I think what it means is that that the experience of fun is facilitated when you have a sense that there are boundaries where that surround uh, uh, your experience and where it is you essentially given license and permission to be having fun within those boundaries. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so Las Vegas had that be being a good example of that because uh, it's, um, you know, the, the, it, it, it is something that you go to, the destination, uh, you know, people go there, you know, maybe on vacation, people go there also on, on conference trips or on, you know, um, uh, you know trade shows, et cetera. But because of the, the, the city was very clever in, in marketing that it is a place that's meant to be special. It's not, it's not your normal place. It's not your regular work. It's only the designated time and space for you. And, and it's okay for you to let loose. That's really what makes, makes the, the appeal of Las Vegas quite, quite uh, uh, interesting. It's interesting finding that we, we found in, uh, in, uh, in some of the literature. Um, there's uh, the island. There's an island off the coast of uh, of Spain called Ibiza, and um, and, and that island, um, they found that consumption of drugs there was significantly higher than it is uh, on the land, and 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 uh, and, 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 and one of the uh, speculation was that uh, the idea that first of all people want to go on the island on their own vacation, their vacation, so they have, so there's special time for them, but also the fact that the island is somehow physically separated from the land, somehow re reinforce this mental separation that you have. And you say, hey, I'm in Ibiza, I can do whatever I want. And uh, uh, whereas, you know, if you be on the land, somehow that, that feeling of, uh, of, of, of boundaries in space is, uh, is, uh, is, is not as, as pronounced. Uh, thank you. Soyum, would you like to ask a question? Oh, uh, yes, um, yeah, I really think it's really interesting research. Um, just have a one question about the level of arousal of being in a state of fun. You mentioned the hedonic engagement. I think it seems to have high level arousal. Yeah. When you are uh, feeling liberated, that is you escape from all this hard work and deadlines that also could be very high level arousal. Then yeah. you feel liberated as a result, you you can lower level of arousal. Yeah. And how do you characterize fun in terms of the, uh, the feeling? Yeah, at some level, at some point, we, we also measured arousal as, as, um, um, as we were studying the theory. And then we also have those. Uh, um, what we found is that um, it, uh, the arousal is more a, uh, an outcome of the experience of fun. It's a dimension of the experience of fun rather than the driver of the experience of fun. And, and, and so, um, so it's on average, we find indeed that experience of fun tend to be um, highly arousing in general. I mean, it's not necessarily the case, uh, but it tend to be more to be highly arousing. Um, what we found is um, it's not just the, uh, the, uh, the pleasant arousal, but also the, uh, the, the decrease of negative arousal also uh, uh, is also fun. So, 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 when, uh, so when you get this, uh, this um, and, and, uh, I forgot which setting we had, but we had uh, some settings in which uh, these people would, were testifying and, and, and sharing the, those experiences where somehow they get the, this, this, this decrease of aversive arousal seems to be I mean, you know, also fun. Yeah. But again, so the point, uh, I want to make is that yes, you can. You're going to have a, a, a there's an emotional dimension, but that's not causal. It's really more of a byproduct of the experience of fun. And Randy, you had a question. Um, hi. Yes. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, very interested in the topic, um, mostly because I like to have fun, but also interested in um, whether it. It really is, requires a real life experience, or can this be simulated online? Like I see my kid plays video games and seems to be having a tremendous amount of fun, but he's talking live with his friends. Yeah, um, does yeah. the same kind of fun exist? And can it be simulated by like the metaverse or Facebook or something like that? Yeah, it, it, it can. Uh, uh, so, so the construct. Is, so, so first of all, what's so? So what? What is what is fun for these kids who are playing on, on online? I think one is uh, this, uh, this uh, many of the games that, that seem to be really fun, 
seem to be one in which they can go free roaming, right? So it's very liberating to be out there and, and exploring the, uh, the, the things. Um, kids also have more that likely to have fun when, when it's, uh, they're allowed to do have it. So which means this is again a space where it's okay for them to be playing. So it's, it's the, the, the console, it could be, the console may be located in a playroom. So again, you create some boundaries, the games themselves create some boundaries and then, um, and then, as you find out, and and, and you just share um, the sense of connectedness that you are doing. Some of the most uh, immersive games are the social games, right? Where, where where you are playing with other players. They don't have to be necessarily in the same room, but the mere fact that you can talk to them, that you have experienced a certain virtual reality at the same time, you know, uh, is also a, a contributor to that. And then the novelty. So all the ingredients of, of that we uncovered. You know, you know, find some translation in those kind of environments. So I'm going to tell him that by limiting his play, I'm making it more fun for him. I I, I don't know if you would tell him that, but uh, but uh, um, well, I'll tell him. <laughs> feel feel free. I mean, I'm not. A, I'm a, parenting is beyond my my pay grade. Okay. okay so thank you very much. Uh, we are at the end of our time, and uh, I'm sure there are other questions. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to forbear. <laughs> um, uh, maybe I'll send you an email. Uh, so thank you again, uh, uh, Professor Pham. Uh, uh, I really like the perspective that you provided uh, on the phenomenon of fun, the historical perspective, the sociological perspective. And I think you kind of didn't have time, you know, to talk about uh, the market uh, element and, uh, you know, the distinction between commercialized fund and non-commercialized fund, mm -hmm. you know, which is which very important for us in the business school. But, uh, you know, we'll uh, look forward to reading your papers uh, about that, you and um, uh, your co-authors. Uh, thank okay. you again. Well, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. So, uh, Laura, um, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay. I'm gonna. I saw your email about the other one. I'm gonna look through. I'm so behind. I mean, which one was that? The last one, right? You sent me an email about the. Oh. Design. Oh yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Um, and I'll start putting the email together to send out for the next one too. Right. Okay. And, um, okay, I think maybe Freddie and Jacqueline maybe are not around. So I'm just going to, you know, remove them. So, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, I mean, I, uh, okay, Fine. yeah. Um, um, yeah, so um, I mean that. So I, I think we had a good. Yeah, why don't you stop recording? Oh yes, sorry. I mean, unless.